hockey season is finally upon us. Man, did it feel that way yesterday in Cranberry. Good morning to you. Good Friday morning. I'm Dayan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports. This is Daily Shot of Penguins. It comes your way bright and early every weekday. If you're into football and or baseball, I also offer Daily Shots of Steelers and Pirates in the same place that you found this. Day one of camp is in the books. The Penguins and most of their main guys took to the ice at 9 a.m., began the first scrimmage at 10 a.m., did some uh, conditioning drills after that, and then they were in the locker room and out of there for the rest of the day. But it was real. It was real, which is my way of saying Eric Carlson was really there. I remember walking into the room initially up to Chris Letang, and I motioned over toward Carlson, who was about three seats to his right, and I go, what is that? And he goes, I know, right? That was the reaction to having Carlson in there. I'm going to have a difficult time explaining this to you because it's just not something that you normally see. But these players were in their own way starstruck. And they're in a room with Sidney Crosby, Evgeny Malkin, and Latang, and, you know, Jake Gensel and other guys, they're starstruck. He said, this has been someone who they faced for a lot of years and would have to spend every pregame focused, obsessed on him, watching film of what it is that he does and how he beats you and how you've got to defend him. And for those Penguins who go way back, meaning the guys who were the remnants of the last championship team, he was the guy that brought their opponent on his back to the Eastern Conference Final, meaning the Senators, of course. It was Carlson and Craig Anderson playing out of his mind in goal. So the respect that they have for this player exceeds just, you know, watching him on TV or whatever. Their respect is mostly accumulated at the player level, meaning the opponent level. And I'll say it again, him being in there was not normal. Now, I'm sure it's going to be over time. But you could even see when he when he first came off, Carlson, he goes and he sits at his stall, and it's like he was radioactive. Nobody was coming near him, okay? Now, that's going to change, of course. I don't mean to be getting anybody, you know, stressed out over this. The assimilation in hockey is natural. And when you're someone like Carlson who actually could be seen going out of his way to try to communicate with other guys, including AHL guys that he has to know aren't going to be making the team. He'll accelerate that. He will. He'll find a way to fit in culturally. He's just a a hockey guy. And for that matter, he's been a leader. He's been a captain. He's someone who knows what he's doing in that world. But what are the Penguins going to do with him? That was the other thought that I had pretty much throughout the day, but particularly when he was on the ice. He was paired with Marcus Pedersen, as I've been telling you for a few weeks that I'd expected. There's the whole countryman thing there, but there's also a nice symbiosis in their play. Pedersen was telling me after practice that he feels like he wouldn't have to change anything to perform alongside Carlson. He feels like his game would actually be suited toward Supporting Carlson, but at the same time taking advantage of how Carlson springs everybody on the rush, including his defense partner at times. That's that's good. That's a nice little start. Doesn't mean they're going to be paired in a season, but these things don't happen by accident. They have weeks and weeks to prepare for these scrimmages, and coaches don't generally throw people together by accident. Carlson was also on the same team in the scrimmage as Evgeny Malkin. Almost always, Sid and Gino are kept on separate teams. Well, Sid's team played against Gino's team, and Carlson was on Gino's team. So Carlson's out there with Gino and Riley Smith, who's probably 
almost certainly going to be Gino's left winger. So you started to see some of that too. That maybe that's the, the quintet that gets formed. Now, there were no power player penalty killing drills. That's going to be coming soon enough, maybe even today. And it's at that point, I strongly suspect that you'll see the first signs of how both Carlson and Latang will be utilized on the power play, on the penalty kill, even at five on five, because as Jeff Carter was joking after the second practice, those guys are going to be out there the whole game, and they just might be. Anybody listening to this program could be the right-handed defenseman on the third pairing of the Pittsburgh Penguins this winter, because you're not going to see much action. And honestly, although both of them have gone out of their way to stress uh, their level of admiration for each other, and I'm not expecting anything remotely resembling issues in this regard, I'm still going to find it really interesting. Every little component to this. Yeah, I had a good talk with Latang. We, we went for a while just going back and forth about some of the stuff that's related uh, to this team, even a little bit to last year's team, but mostly about Carlson. And one of the interesting points that Latang had in, in our in our time was that he and Carlson don't have similar games. And I've been trying to tell people that for a while, and it was good to have it come from his mouth. They're not the same guy. Uh, Latang's never been a pure offensive defenseman in the sense that he prioritizes it. His game, as Brooks Orpik once told me many years ago, and I never forgot it, always begins from the back. He creates everything that he creates from the back by being stout, by being sturdy at the Pittsburgh blue line. Carlson is just a a wandering maestro, okay, <laughs> which is not at all what Latang is. So that was one good point to bring up. Another was that they've both got the self-confidence and the self-awareness to be able to handle the circumstance or even embrace the circumstance. I asked Carlson if he felt that Latang was respected enough around the NHL. Listen to his answer. Yeah, yes, I, and I think he does too. Uh, I think he does have the respect around the league, among, at least amongst the players. Um, you know, I've known him for a, for a very long time from from various events and stuff. So it's going to be nice to to get to know him on a personal level. Uh, but everything I've heard and everything that you know I've observed and seen, uh, you know, from afar is, is nothing but a great, hard-working, dedicated guy. So uh, it's going to be fun to, to be teammates. I'm curious, did your experience with Brent Burns when you went to San Jose? Did that kind of prepare you for something like this? Because everyone. I remember when, when, that, when that happened, everyone was like, oh, wow, how can you have two of them? We'll see. I mean, any experience is good experience. So um, I'm just excited to be here, and uh, you know, it's going to be fun to play against uh, or playing with, you know, a lot of good players, and, and you know, Tanger is one of them. And uh, you know, I'm 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 curious to see, uh, you know, how far we're going to go. Yeah, we'll see. But man, it's going to be the kind of thing that you see without being able to take your eyes off it. When we come back, J1Q. Robert, who says, hey, DK, I love the Eric Carlson trade. If for nothing else, then it's breathed life back into the Penguins. But taking it back a few months, would you have preferred getting Connor Hellebuck or Carlson? Which moves the needle more for this franchise? Oh, Robert, I'm going to get the boring stuff out of the way with this response, which is that no deal happened for Hellebuck. He's still in Winnipeg. Uh, the Jets opened their training camp yesterday, and Hellebuck sent some mixed signals about his future there. On one hand, he said, I really like the young talent that we have. On the other hand, I'm you know keeping all of my options open. Don't forget that Hellebuck has another year on his existing contract. And don't further forget that Hellebuck would have needed to be a sign and trade to get executed with Pittsburgh. And then from there, add on that Tristan Jari was already signed. 
So, yeah, your cap space situation wasn't even going to be remotely similar to what happened with the Sharks. San Jose really needed to move Carlson. Winnipeg didn't need to move Hellebuck. San Jose was in a position to take on all kinds of salary. Winnipeg wasn't. Winnipeg, in fact, wanted their exchange to be, and rightly so, the polar opposite of what the Carlson trade was, meaning you would have never dumped off a Jeff Petrie, Mikhail Granlund, and all that money in Winnipeg's direction. It would have been the opposite. They would have been asking for a ton of picks. They would have been asking for futures, and they sure as heck weren't going to take on money. Why should they? So Kyle Dubas wasn't really in a position to get Hellebuck. In fact, again, nobody was because Hellebuck's still there. Maybe that'll change as we get closer to the NHL trade deadline when the calendar flips. But he's still there and he's still there for a reason. Now, who would I have wanted? I mean, it's goaltending. You know, I don't know how there's even a discussion to be had here. It's goaltending. And you're talking about one of the two or three best goaltenders in the world in Hellebuck. Now, did the Penguins come away with a possible solution by having Jari, by hoping that he's healthy, by pushing him to do what's needed to be done to sustain his health over the long term? Sure, sure. I've said this many times, and I'll keep repeating it no matter how many times it flies back in my face. When Jari's on, he's a top five or six in this league. When he's on, he can go into any building and beat any goaltender head to head, including, by the way, Hellebuck, which he's done on a regular basis, including Andre Vasilevsky, including Sergei Bobrovsky. He's done it time and again. And when he does, it's just, oh, yeah, well, that's just normal. Or the team played well in front of him. No, no, no. He's beating these. He's outperforming these guys head to head. And from there, I think if you're looking at this from the Pittsburgh perspective, you've got to count your lucky stars that the Carlson trade even came anything close to what it actually ended up being. I mean, moving out all that salary, moving out those unwanted players, And bringing this guy in? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? I I can't say this enough, but I'm going to repeat it from the opening segment. Carlson's here. Carlson's in Pittsburgh. He's wearing a penguin sweater. He had 101 points last season for a team that only scored 234 goals. Did you know that? He was the first defenseman in the NHL, in 31 years to hit 100 points. And the Sharks stunk. The Sharks were a last-place team. I referred earlier to his being a maestro. It's not just that. He's not the conductor. Last year, he was the conductor and the orchestra and the janitor who swept up afterward. He did everything. He did everything. He doesn't have to do that in Pittsburgh. He doesn't even need to be on the depth chart anyway, the number one defenseman even if he's that in reality. Don't don't look for reasons to not like this exchange. I appreciate the question. I appreciate everybody listening to Daily Shot of Penguins. And by the way, if you're up in Cranberry and you happen to see a tall guy walking around with a credential around his neck and a DK Pittsburgh Sports t-shirt or hoodie, since it gets a little bit chilly in there, feel free by all means to stop me and say hello. You won't be bugging me, trust me. I'll be happy to do it. Let's get together again Monday, everybody. 